Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And I am here with my honored guest, Brenda Davis. Uh, Brenda has been a plant-based dietitian and nutritionist for over 30 years. She was one of the most popular vegan speakers on the speaking circuit and author of 12 books, including her latest book, Nourish, the definitive plant-based nutrition guide for families. You know, every once in a while, if you're lucky in life, you get a chance to have a conversation with one of your heroes. And oh, I have that privilege today. Thank you for being here. Brenda. Well, it's really my uh, honor and privilege. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so let's go back to that time, uh, 19, fellow uh, uh, long-term vegan. Uh, we've both been vegan for over 30 years. I'll celebrate my vegan anniversary next month for 36 oh. years. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> I know the date. It, it was a big date in my life. Um, it was a dramatic shift in the way I saw the world. Um, for me, the whole worldview changed, not just my chain, my uh, view on diet, uh, but it was an extension. It was a it was like an, a big bang of compassion <laughs> as, as my view of my relationship with not only myself, but other people, but also with the animals, the environment and the universe at large. It was a huge shift for me. Um, it's interesting reading your story uh, about what triggered you. And it must be funny to say that what inspired you to go vegan was a hunter. <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> well, it, it's so funny because, you know, when I was in high school, I was kind of interested in all things vegetarian. I just found it so intriguing. But I, I had only ever met one real live vegetarian in my life. And uh, he was my grade eight science teacher. And I can rem still remember my dad saying, you know, I just can't understand how he could do that to his children. You know, it's one thing to eat that way yourself, but it, that's just child abuse. <laughs> and mm. So I grew up in a family that consumed, you know, a very omnivorous diet. And but but there were, you know, I can remember when I was really little, um, I, you know, I used to pick the worms off the sidewalk. You probably did, too, <laughs> um, to save them from getting all dried up. And, and I can remember when I was about three years old, my parents brought me to a bullfight in Spain. We lived in Germany at the time. We were on a, a Canadian Air Force base. And, um, and, and I can still remember thinking, I don't understand why bull, bulls would be fighting one another. Uh, and then when I got there, I realized the bulls weren't fighting one another, they were fighting people. And and I was absolutely mortified. And I, I can still remember when the, the bull got some sort of a point against the matador, uh, the whole 10,000 people in the stadium, this was their national hero, El Cordobes. The whole place fell silent, except for this one little girl who jumped up on her seat and I was cheering for the bull. And, and, and I was just, I mean, I just felt so much for this animal. And I think, for many children, that's the case. I I have to tell this story too, because when my son was three years old, same age as I was at the bullfight, um, and of course we were we were pretty much, you know, we were vegetarian vegan at that time, and he's 33 years old now. But I can remember driving by McDonald's, and and he said to me, he said, uh, "Mommy, can we stop for a McDonald's hamburger?" And I and and I I remember thinking to myself, I think it's time to tell him why we don't eat those things. Mm -hmm. And and I know he 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 watched the commercials of the hamburger stealing hamburgers off the trees, and right. and he had no idea where hamburgers came from. And and right. so I thought, you know, I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell him. And so I said to him, you know. The hamburgers at McDonald's aren't the same as the hamburgers at home. At, at McDonald's, the hamburgers are made of cows. Um, at home, the hamburgers are made of beans and rice and, you know, those kinds of plants. And he looked at me and he said, Mommy, people do not eat cows. <laughs> as if I had totally lost my marbles. Right. And I, I fell silent for a second and he said, 
do they, mommy? Do they? And and um, I responded that they do. And he looked at me and he said, but mommy, them have eyes. Don't they know that cows are people too? And, and I understood, you know, what he was saying was these are sentient beings. They, right. he went on, he said, they have ears, they have mouths, they have noses, they have all the things we have. And, and uh, he was just so shocked. And, and he got invited to a McDonald's birthday party a couple of weeks later. And I remember he was in the lineup um to get something and at that time the only thing he could really have they had a salad they had vegetarian pizza um so i thought well i suppose he could have that it's not vegan but anyway um he got to the front of the line he ordered a hamburger with no cows inside <laughs> the lady didn't quite know what to make of him but anyway um That's that's funny. I had a, a similar experience. I was invited to speak for a, a grade school class, right? It was like third grade, fourth grade, somewhere around there, and maybe younger. Because, um, But I said, uh, you know, does anybody know where, where meat comes from? And one kid was like, oh, yeah, I do, I do, I do. And I'm like, yeah, what is it? And he goes, well, they milk the cow, and then the milk turns into meat. Wow. And I, and I said, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. They actually kill the cow. And the boy, his face lit up and he goes, no, it doesn't. My dad said this and he's not a liar. You can't call my dad a liar. Oh. And I'm like, okay, where do I go with this? No kidding. But that is the big lie we've been told. And it's, it's amazing and kind of sad that there are 40, 50, 60 year old adults who still believe this lie. No. Yeah, it, it you know, and that's what happened to me with the hunter story. So bring bringing us back to that story. I was a public health nutritionist in northern Ontario. I, I was teaching Canada's food guide, which at that time had four food groups, two of which were animal products, you know, meat and dairy. Uh, and and uh, but I found myself more and more shifting towards plant foods and and I, I, we were, I was even at the point where my husband and I really did um, eat a lot of plant-based meals. And this was, you know, in the mid eighties, uh, we were married in 1978. So anyway, um, uh, this friend of ours, uh, he was actually our best man at our wedding. He was on his way deer hunting and, um, and he stopped by the house on his way for a little visit. And, and I remember thinking as he was driving to the house, how can I stop him from killing another innocent animal? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I decided to, to, you know, sort of grill him about it. And I said to him, I said, I, I don't understand why you feel okay about taking this gun into the bush and shooting an innocent animal who just wants to live. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I, the only thing I can think of is it somehow makes you feel like more of a man. Uh, it's like this macho thing that you have to kill something. And it was his response um, to that challenge that actually changed the course of my life. Um, because he said to me, he said, you know, he said, just because you don't have the guts to pull the trigger does not mean you're not responsible for the trigger being pulled. Every time you buy your piece of meat camouflaged in cellophane in the grocery store. And then he said, at least the animals I eat have had a life. Can you say the same for the ones that are sitting on your plate? And I was silenced, absolutely silenced, because I had no response. All I knew was it was time for me to learn more about animal agriculture. Um, because I wasn't, we were so far removed from that, that we didn't have to take responsibility for it. And, um, and I just, um, I, 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 I just vowed to myself at that moment that I would begin to take responsibility for the food that I was eating. And, and so I, I started to do some investigations. And the first thing, of course, was to, to learn a little bit more about, um, 
animal agriculture. And so I, I did a lot of searches and I, I read books, I, as much as I could. And it, it didn't take me very long to say, I can't, I can't contribute to a system that causes such pain and suffering and so much death when I don't have to, right. um, you know, I just, I thought about it. I thought I'm a, I'm a dietitian. If I can't design a diet for my family that works, uh, not causing that kind of, or contributing to that kind of pain and suffering, why, you know, why wouldn't I do that? And so I just, I, I just thought I, I, I need to talk to my husband. My children were four and one at the time. And, um, and I said to my husband, I said, I, I would like to become completely vegetarian. Would you, you know, be willing to do that? And at that point, we'd been married about 10 years. And um, my husband looked at me and he smiled. And he said, I thought you'd never ask. He said, no. I would love to be a vegetarian. <laughs> and of course, neither one of us, we were in Northern Ontario, that's hunting and fishing territory. We never really known real vegetarians. So this was, we were both a little nervous. Our parents were terrified that we were gonna have malnourished children. Um, so it was, uh, it was, I mean, I, my husband and the reason um, he said to me, he said, you know, when I was in university doing environmental sciences and such, he said, we learned that the, the best way anybody can lessen their carbon footprint is to eat lower on the food chain. And so he said, I've kind of always wanted to do that. So I thought, boy, did I, did I pick well? <laughs> um, it, was, it was really wonderful. So we were able to go on that journey uh, together and really, um, you know, just, uh, just do it. And, and um, our children didn't, you know, my son is, six one or whatever my my children didn't uh you know um suffer from it they did very well academically and grew big and tall and and uh so yeah i mean it was uh it was it was the best thing we ever did and and i i i was you know the other thing um is that i was really uh unsure about how i could continue to be a registered dietitian. Um, and, and talk about that because I mean, it's one thing being just a vegan and especially back in the eighties when this was, mm -hmm. everybody looked like you, like you had a hole in your head and didn't know what you're talking about, right? That's All right. The, woo -woo, oh, there's no research was, based on your diet. No, <laughs> and, and you know what? It, it was uh, when I was in university, I can remember the day that we were learning about vegetarian diets and and I was excited. I was a first year nutrition student and I really was interested in vegetarian diets. I just, they intrigued me. Mm -hmm. And we learned two things that day. We learned that vegetarian diets were risky, um, uh, very risky uh, for, and should not be used for children or pregnant women. And vegan diets were just downright dangerous and inappropriate for everyone. And that's all we learned. That was it. End of story. That was my education in university about vegetarian diets. And it was very discouraging. And it was kind of like this big slap on the wrist for even thinking that such a thing could be done. And so when I made the decision to become essentially vegan, um, it was really scary because I thought I would be ousted by my profession that that um, it was so fringy and I never wanted to be fringy. I always liked to be respected and, and, um, and accepted and well liked and all of the things that we tend to, you know, hold dear within our little tribes. And this was one of my important tribes was the nutrition community. And, uh, and so it was really scary. And I honestly, considered uh, the possibility of another profession. And I, I thought, well, I had been interested in going into law, maybe I could you know, go back to school for that. Um, but I, I, I remember this conversation I had in my own head. I thought to myself, I, you know, I had actually done a lot of searching. I, I looked at a lot of World Health Organization documents and diff just different things that gave me a much broader picture than my education at university did in terms of global nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I can remember thinking to myself, if I leave 
and everybody that sees that bigger picture and what we're actually doing as a, a species on this planet. Yes. Uh, if everybody that gets that just, you know, exit stage left and, uh, and, and does something else, what will ever change? Um, so I thought I have to have the courage to uh, try to change my profession from within and, and the notion of nutrition. And I, I desperately wanted to help anybody that saw that bigger picture and wanted to adopt a plant-based diet to do it really well. Uh, that was a, a huge goal for me in, in my career. And so I made a decision and the decision was really simple that I would, um, that I would make sure that all my I's were dotted and my T's were crossed and I would know my stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, I could debate just about anyone on this topic. And so that's what I did. And, and it was interesting because within about a year of adopting this diet, we actually moved to Vancouver and from Northern Ontario and, and, and Vancouver is kind of like the California of Canada, more progressive thinking people. And, and so I can still remember going to meet, to meet the first, you know, vegetarians, real live vegetarians <laughs> that I would ever meet. It was an earth safe potluck. Nice. And I was so nervous going in there because I, I just, had this image of vegetarians being hippies with long hair and, you know, non-matching clothes. And I couldn't not match. It's just, it's not part of my DNA. I just, I don't, I just look like a regular person. I couldn't look like a hippie even if I tried. And, and so I was really scared that I, we would, our whole family would just stick out like a sore thumb and they go, what are they doing here? And, uh, but we walked in and I couldn't believe my eyes. There were hippies, but there were people of every walk of life that looked like, you know, what they would look like in any, you know, concert or uh, outing that you might attend. Uh, so it was uh, it was a quite quite a joyful moment for me. I, when I became vegan, I didn't even know there was the word vegan. I wasn't even aware of it till about a year after. And wow. somebody, when I was describing my diet, I just don't do any animals. I don't wear them. I don't, you know, do anything. I just don't want to participate in the suffering. And they said, oh, you're vegan. And I'm like, oh, cool. There's a there's word, a word for, for this. For it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, particular to growing up in, uh, a community of other practitioners and science entrenched folks that were dogmatic. So, uh, but their teaching was based on what we now know, fortunately to new research was wrong and they weren't aware of it. So I don't hold that against anybody, but no. now in this day and age, there's so much research out there that is making it completely clear, a, a microbiome. If you do not understand how important the microbiome and fiber is to our health, you do not understand why plants should be the focus of our diet. I mean, it's becoming so obviously clear. All right, what, what does microbiome feed on? Fiber, obviously prebiotic fibers, oligosaccharides, polysaccharides, polyphenols, and resistant starches all come from plants, all. So what are you saying? The good bacteria, if they're not in our gut, we die. We don't survive. Our immune doesn't function. Our digestion doesn't function. So what are we saying? Well, you know, it's so interesting because it's only been maybe 15 or 20 years at most that we've really started to understand um, the repercussions of the health of our gut microbiome. Um, it, 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 we didn't get that it affects how our brain functions. It, right. it affects every, every aspect of our health and, and, um, it, it affects inflammation. It, it, it affects everything. It affects our risk of diabetes. It affects our risk of overweight and obesity. It affects everything. And, and, you know, we've got the biggest, uh, I would say rival to plant-based diets are keto diets and paleo diets and very animal-centered diets. Yeah. And when you eat an animal-centered diet, it's impossible to get enough 
fiber. It's I, it, I think it's very well, we've got studies showing the decline in the health of the gut microbiome when you're consuming those kinds of diets. And uh, it just saddens me because when you think about it, we have to think about the consequences of what we consume not only for ourselves, but beyond ourselves. Yes. That means we need to think about the consequences for the animals that we share this planet with. We need to think about the consequences for the planet itself. And we're in a global climate crisis. We, we have so many, and we're in a pandemic where there are so many issues that we're facing that are related to our insatiable appetites for animal products and it's got to stop if 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 we're to survive as a species if we're to leave anything for our grandchildren it's yes. got to stop with their you know i am absolutely certain that if if this planet if the human species of this planet doesn't move towards a you know a, a largely or predominantly or exclusively plant-based diet we don't have a chance in hell. Um, you know, I'm not sure that we have a chance, even if we do. Um, <laughs> but if we don't, we're hooped. <laughs> so. Well, I think we can move. Fortunately, we're seeing a boom in the commercial market, even with products. I mean, when Nestle is dedicating over a billion dollars to uh, development of plant-based products, when you're seeing, you know, the largest corporations getting involved, the big CPG companies, trillion dollar companies now heavily investing in, I, I think we can turn this around faster than anything. One, I like that it's being driven by consumer demand. The consciousness is happening. Talk about a, a roots uh, movement. It's happening from the consumer up. The consumer is actually changing the supply. That was the other way around. The big corporations were telling us what we should eat and pumping out these cheap chemical laden crap foods. Mm -hmm. And we were suffering in health because of it. Now that our health care system is about ready to implode and can't even handle the amount of sick people, we're now saying, oh, maybe we should start doing something about this. Um, yeah, and you know that you and I, um, we have gone through the, you know, three plus decades of changes. Yes. And it, it it's so interesting because for quite a long time, it wasn't very easy to be vegan. The the <laughs> offerings were very limited. The cheese tasted like plastic. Uh, the milks were all gritty. Uh, it was really not easy. Uh, today, um, we've got these fermented nut cheeses. We've got these amazingly delicious plant-based milks. We've got all kinds of veggie meats, some of which taste so much like animal meats. It's amazing. Some people get confused in taste tests even. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different world. And, and I think that it's just getting easier and easier. And and, and what I, 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 I can't remember the exact um, numbers, but uh, the Vegetarian Resource Group just mm -hmm. did their, you know, they do these surveys and, and the percentage of young people that are eating plant-based is just incredible because young people get it. They get that they want to have a future and they want a future for their children. Uh, and so they they get that, that climate change more and more is related to our choices, not just fossil fuels, but our choices of what food we eat. And uh, and and so it's changed. Things are changing. And I think it's the rate of that change is uh, very rapid and and very oh, encouraging. That's Let's touch on that a little bit. When I when I was uh, um, I was a raw foodist for 100% raw foodist for about four years, um, and when I was doing that, I was at a raw food convention, and they were saying, "How can we get more people to consume more raw food?" And I was like, "Okay, well, wait a minute. You got to tie the action to the result." Now, a lot of people are so stressed and in such physical pain with physical ailments. There is a subconscious program going on saying, I want to reduce this pain or stop the pain. And subconsciously, I believe 
we are making choices that intentionally shorten our life because our life is stressful or painful or uncomfortable. So there is an unconscious part of our eating habits, of our choices, that we are actually killing ourselves on purpose in a way, not full on consciously, but that we're making these choices because they are trying to end the pain. So I think anybody can agree with, hey, feeling really bad pain, whether it's emotional, spiritual, physical, psychological, pain sucks, suffering sucks. <laughs> and we'll do almost anything. I'll take a drug, I'll take a pill, I'll do anything to get rid of the pain, right? And I think we reach for food and drugs and alcohol and different things to try to ease this pain. But how can you get someone who says, okay, eat this and you're going to live longer? Well, that's that's <laughs> no. not preferable if you're suffering, right? No, you don't want I, to la make suffering last longer. Well, I, I think part of it too, one of the things that I see, and, and I, I think that's a really interesting the way that, that sort of um, you've thought about that. Uh, one of the things that I often think about is, is there, there are many things that are so important to people. But I think one of the things that's the most important is to belong, uh, is, to, acceptance. is to have that tribe where you feel comfortable and you fit and you, you, you know, these are the people you love. They're your family, your friends. Yeah. And, and one of the things that makes you separated from the, those tribes is doing things differently than the rest yeah. of the, the tribe. And so as long as normal is eating animals, it will be hard for people to pull away from that because it's almost worse not to belong than to be unhealthy. Um, you know, you'd almost sooner die than not belong. Um, and, and so the thing that gives me real hope in that regard is that it's getting easier to belong yeah. as as a person who's eating plant-based it's more popular it's more acceptable there are all kinds of wonderful choices you can even eat at a fast food restaurant and eat eat a uh, plant-based uh, you know uh, burger if you want mm -hmm. um and so i think as as the world changes and you know it becomes simpler for people to feel okay about making some different dietary choices. And so everything we can do as individuals, we don't ever want to um, be disrespectful of others or, or judgmental. Um, we want to, I don't think we ever make friends by spitting in someone's face no. um, or, or draw them into um, what we think is, is an ethical way of living or eating. Uh, so I think better is to share food, to share joyful, um, you know, social engagements, to do fun things with them. And, and you know, what never ceases to amaze me is how even the most ardent, you know, meat eaters will appreciate uh, really good food. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it's just really good food. I can remember yeah. once uh, my husband um, asking me if he could invite some out of town business, you know, um, people for uh, dinner to our house. And he worked at WorkSafe uh, in, in, as an inspector at that time. And, and um, I said, oh, sure, no problem. So I, I made a, a really nice uh, meal with, you know, vegan lasagna and I'd made calzones, these stuffed things. And I, I made a huge uh, salad and all sorts of nice food. Anyway, the next day they go to uh, work and everybody at work is teasing them saying, so you guys had a vegetarian meal last night. And the two of them at the very same time said, no, we didn't. What are you talking about? Because it never occurred to them. <laughs> I they didn't even they know. Actually, no, all they knew <laughs> is they had a really nice meal that they thoroughly enjoyed. They were thoroughly yeah. satisfied. They said, no, we didn't. We had a great meal. We had this and this and this. <laughs> and then they looked at each other and they went, oh my God, it was vegetarian. <laughs> it just didn't. People just want to have good food and enough of it. And, uh, and the company of 
people that they can laugh with and share with. And so um, I think that's really important. And if we bring something to share to work, we've made some cool kale chips or whatever it is that people can taste, it breaks down those walls. It breaks yes. down the barriers. And so to me, one of the best things we can do is to be fun, joyful, and share great food. And I think that's what will, you know, bring people in more than just about anything else. So obviously within the medical and the practitioner community, um, uh, especially with the, the main emphasis being on pharmaceutical drugs, which is uh, sickness care rather than prevention, how was that? You're, you you come across as such a likable, such a, a, a humble person, and, and I love your approach, but how was that dealing with a community that was hardened in their ways and you're right and wrong this is the science you know mm -hmm. uh you know that 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 black and white mentality of if it's not in the science it's just not true and, you well know, you know i i mean you were I, like a revolutionary although you yeah. probably were reluctant to use that term for yourself. <laughs> but i was and i and i and i have to say that i expected that i might be ousted from the profession i expected um a lot of resistance from my peers mm -hmm. and i was absolutely stunned that i didn't get as much of a, of it as i thought i would um but i i was i was very respectful to people i was very evidence-based in what i said and what i found i remember when we wrote our first book and it came out in 1994 becoming vegetarian the dairy industry in Canada took wrote a 45 page rebuttal to the book. They were so upset that we had a chapter called Without Dairy. They thought it would be a real pro dairy book. And of course it wasn't. It was a vegan book in disguise. And um, and they took a full page ad out in our professional journal. Uh, to discredit us, they called us irresponsible dietitians. And I don't think any dietitian at that point had ever really said that it was possible to survive without dairy. <laughs> so it was like an essential food group. And, and so this was really stepping uh, away from the norm. And, uh, and what was really interesting is um, we found out, I mean, I was mortified when it happened. I was absolutely mortified. And then I walked into an Earth Safe potluck and got a standing ovation. Everybody was so excited. They said, because the dairy industry wouldn't have spent that kind of money making these little 45 page books available to free of charge to every healthcare professional in Canada, if they weren't scared, uh, you know, they're worried. And, and so, and, and then, and then what happened is we found out that the dietitians at a big hospital in Vancouver, they used that 45 page rebuttal as their entertainment at lunch. And they, they actually told Vasanto and I, that that they would be rolling on the floor laughing at how absurd the claims of the dairy industry were. Um, and and so they, you know, they would go back to our book and then read their little things taken out of context. And and so I, I so what what ended up happening was uh, our our peers, um, we started Vasanto and I, my writing partner, started being invited to speak at major conferences like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which was the American Dietetic Association in those days. I can remember speaking at one of their conferences. Uh, the room that I was speaking in held 900 people. We had 300 people on the floor sitting everywhere they could on the floor and probably 200 people out the door that couldn't get in. And it was the second biggest selling lecture of the whole conference. This is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And then I started getting invited to speak and at dietetic conferences in other countries, Spain and Italy and Germany and Belgium and you know just the UK and uh, Taiwan. They put on the first national uh, nutrition conference of Taiwan and I was the keynote presenter for that. And, and so it just started that people actually 
wanted the information, how could they help their clients who were plant-based or when I was speaking to physicians, their patients who were plant-based um, do this well and they wanted the information. And so it was, it was really so much better than I expected it would be in that regard. I can remember speaking at the Dietitians of Canada and, and after my lecture, I was sitting in this room doing a little interview for them. And at the end of this interview, this lady came up to me. She was one of the chief executive officers or whatever of Dietitians of Canada. And she handed me this little package and she said, I just want to say that you make me proud to be a dietitian. Mm. And, and, you know, it brings almost tears to my eyes because I expected I was going to be ousted from my profession and I wasn't. I was embraced and respected. And, you know, Vasanto, she's 78 years old now, but two or three years ago, she received the highest award offered by Dietitians of Canada. It's called the Riley Jeffs Memorial Lecture Award. And, um, and it was, you know, the greatest, I mean, it really is the greatest honor bestowed upon a dietitian and uh, in our country. And um, it usually goes to researchers at universities and things like that. And it, it's just, it just warms my heart that, that we've come as far as we've come, but that we've been uh, so respected and accepted by our peers th through the whole journey. Um, and many people don't realize that, but it, it really is true. So we're very fortunate in that regard. Amazing to go from fearing losing your job and being ostracized by the very community that you've dedicated your life to, to going to be a vegan celebrity in this day and age. <laughs> what a turn around. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> well, it's, it's a movement that's time has come and uh, you and I and many other people who are long-termers have been waiting for this moment for all of our lives, I guess to speak. There's a lot of work to be done, but it's nice to be uh, finally in some ways vindicated, but more, it, to me, that's not the important part. The, to me, the important part is seeing the movement really accelerate, knowing that less and less animals are gonna be suffering. And we're, we're at the greatest amount of suffering um, that this planet has ever experienced with over a trillion animals killed every single year. I mean, that's more than all of the human beings killed in all of the wars since this since we've been a species on this planet. And we're doing that every year. I mean, that's, that's mind boggling how much suffering is at the hands of, of humans who aren't even aware of their connection to the suffering. No, and it's, it's absolutely positively unjustifiable. There's nothing that we could ever say that would justify that kind of carnage. I um, nothing and and we as a species need species need to recognize that it's just got to stop I, I mean I just imagine um, you know um, another um, thinking uh, species on a different planet looking down at this planet uh, and seeing uh, what is really going on it, it would it's just horrific it's absolutely horrific and it's completely unnecessary even if you absolutely must eat meat, we've got to be smart enough to learn to culture this stuff. And they, and they are. They're, they're, we're at that stage now where we're actually able to grow meat in a lab for people that really must eat this stuff. Um, and to me, I celebrate every step that we take towards, uh, you know, shutting slaughterhouses down. Uh, to me, that is... Um, you know, really what it's all about. We need to do that. And and you know what's what's wonderful about the whole plant-based movement is that that not only are we, when we make these choices, reducing pain, suffering, and death in animals, but we're preserving the planet and preserving our own health in the process. If you look around the world, the healthiest, longest lived people on this planet uh, eat plant-based diets. Uh, we know that. We know we have studies of um, comparing people that that consume um, plant based versus um, veg, you know, vegan versus vegetarian versus semi vegetarian versus lacto ovo or lacto ovo vegetarian versus omnivorous, all of these different dietary patterns. 
and and we followed uh, communities such as the Adventist um, the Adventists in the Adventist Health Study and and the folks in Epic Oxford in the UK and the Taiwanese Health Study in Taiwan and we've compared the rates of of heart disease and diabetes and hypertension and cancers and gallbladder disease and and diverticular disease and kidney disease and kidney stones and 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 non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and yeah. so on and so forth and uh, and and be, being plant based is is unquestionably a big health advantage and we're seeing people who are some of the most quoted um you know nutrition experts on the planet like Walter Willett who who you know very simply state that the optimal intake of red meat is zero uh, we see people like David Katz who for years um you know was um, I would say plant forward in his thinking, but now he is uh, very plant based in his thinking, and uh, and and uh, is he's a, an absolute, in my view, an absolute genius. And so I think people people such as um, you know Walter Willett and David Katz and some of the most quoted nutrition authorities on the planet that are that are really advocating of very plant-based diets for all of these reasons. Um, it, it, and people can look at, look at the recommendations of almost every major health authority that we have, the FAO, the WHO, uh, whether it's cancer groups or, or heart disease groups, they're all saying the same thing. They're all saying, eat predominantly plants, eat more fruits and vegetables, eat more fiber, eat more legumes, uh, eat more whole grains, uh, eat fewer processed foods and animal products. It's yeah. very consistent among health authorities. So I think we we know enough. Uh, and that's the bottom line. We know enough. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and, and thank you for the work you've done and many of the other uh, people within the medical community who have had the light bulb turn on. Because I think it's important though to recognize there's so many facets that need to do this. We need the environmental message out there. We need the nutritional message out there. We need the new research finally coming to to mar you know to 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 the the common person. Uh, we need the uh, retailers and 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 the makers of food products to make changes. These changes have to come on all of the different levels to make this to make this work. It's not just education. I mean, I grew up, my, both my parents were professors, university professors, so I grew up around academia. And of course, this was very important to me. And one of the things my father said that reminds me of something you said earlier, he said, if, if the best way I found to learn is to teach, because you'll go out and want to find the best information available to give to the people you're sharing it with. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Very wise man. <laughs> yes. And I remember, I remember as a kid, he was we were washing potatoes in the sink, and he picked up a potato and looked at it, and he says, "Jeff, I'm I'm holding your body in my hand." And I'm like, "Ah, oh, no, Dad, that's just a potato." He goes, "But you're going to eat this." And your body knows the wisdom how to turn this potato into the cells of your body. And I'm like, wow. And, and I wish we would taught that in school, the connection between what we're eating, something that dies. If you look at roadkill, an animal dying on the side of the road, you see what it looks like, full of all the putrazines and cadaverines, breaking down those tissues, rotting and smelling and awful. And that's what we're putting in our body as opposed to these plants with phytochemicals and polyphenols and antioxidants and all these wonderful chemicals that are designed to heal this body. It's exactly. amazing. <laughs> and every, you know, and, and if people just think about it, every single cell of your body is a product of what you put in your mouth. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're made of. Exactly. Uh, you know, you stop and, eating, you die. It's pretty yeah, simple. Yeah, it's, it's what you're it's what your brain is made of it's it's uh, you know it's it's what you're made of and so when you think about it and you compare uh, plant foods with the fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants and plant sterols and stanols and the enzymes that convert phytochemicals into their active mm -hmm. forms and all the food for your microbiome and all of these wonderful things and then you compare that to the animal products that are you know, they have no fiber, they have no phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are plant chemicals. Uh, they, they have a lot of 
the wrong kinds of fats, the saturated fat, and they 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 come packaged. I mean, red meat with new 5GC, which is pro-inflammatory molecule. Yeah. They, you yeah. know, the production of TMAO, the endotoxins from the gram-negative dead bacteria. They, you know, and it goes on. And and of course, you cook meat, and it forms heterocyclic amines and all of you know carcinogens and. And, and then you've got people, you know, advocating these meat predominant diets. And I don't get it because we know, we know the consequences for the environment. We know the consequences for animals. And um, definitely we know the consequences for human health. We've got studies that, that actually compare, um, you know, or look at what, what would happen if you take three percent of your calories from animal products and swap them for just three percent of calories that's 60 calories in a 2000 calorie diet uh with plant foods and what would happen well what would happen is your risk of death would go down 34 percent if the swap was processed meat uh, it would be about 19 percent if the swap was eggs it would be about 12 percent if the if the swap was red meat it would you know and 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 so the story goes for every single animal product we get a reduction in in our risk of mortality by swapping out the animal products for for plant protein products like beans and nuts and seeds and uh, and that that isn't just one study and that was a huge study by the way like 130,000 people but we have many many studies looking at there was a huge japanese study of over 70,000 people that did the same thing swap out um three percent of animal protein with uh plant protein and the risk of you know cancer and heart disease it was dropping by 40 50 percent and that was this tiny little bit of food uh so we we know there there's you know, just no question at all that um, that that when we get our calories from plants, um, it it does us a whole lot of good. And and you know, we think of ourselves personally. Look at you. Look at me. I mean, I'm 62 years old, and and I, I honestly I don't feel much different than I did when I was 30. And and I can I'm I. I can run as fast, I can, you know, all of those things. I'm strong, I can do, I don't know how many men's pushups. I, it's, it's, um, I'm finding that I'm not declining as fast right. physically as my peers, uh, the same age as I am. Uh, and I, I know it's not a coincidence, <laughs> it's not. Um, when you Both. nourish yourself well, uh, your body, I mean, your body wants to stay healthy for as long as possible. And, uh, and that's, you know, how else can it stay healthy? Um, if it, you have to be providing it with adequate nutrition. So, yeah, it's. Uh, and, and look, I, uh, I'm 58 myself. And I've outlived in, in years, the number of years alive on this planet. I outlived both my father and my brother. They wow. were both dead by this this age. Wow! Uh, and here I am. It, yeah, I'm, win, I'm winning national awards uh, for natural bodybuilding championships at, oh, that's at almost sixty years of age. You oh, know, that's, and that's and so it's awesome. like that's that's what health and nutrition. This is an amazing uh, chemistry. It's a self healing machine. That's why I encourage people to keep their machine clean, right? Yeah. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> Um, so, you know, and I think there are um, better forms of nutrition. Like, uh, I love the field of adaptogen, adaptogenic herbs. Um, the, you know, when I was doing research on them for, because uh, the Russians were using them for their athletes and were performing outstandingly well in the Olympics, and everybody's like, what they're doing, they must be doing steroids. And they're actually doing adaptogenic herbs. And, <laughs> and so I got into it and I was looking at the cellular mechanisms and I found that the heat shock proteins and the adaptogen stress proteins were upregulated by these, these adaptogenic herbs. And I was like, this is fantastic. This is plants helping our bodies adapt to stressors better. What a wow. beautiful relationship. These plants are giving gifts to us that we <laughs> cannot get without them. That's All amazing. we have to do is consume them. I mean, it's like, and you do not get these, these properties from eating any animal product. As a matter of fact, just the opposite, they're detrimental. I mean, yeah. It, the more, you know, I, I had a, uh, I had one of my favorite biology teachers in college was a Jesuit. 
he was a priest. <laughs> He's a collar wearing <laughs> priest. And I'm like, teaching science? <laughs> you know? So I walked up to him and I said, I really love your classes. You're so passionate about what you teach. And I said, but do you feel a conflict between being religious and, and, and teaching science? And he said, absolutely not, just the opposite. He goes, the more I understand about physiology and how beautifully we are symbiotic with our nature, with the plants, with the animals of this world, so that just makes me a stronger believer. Science just confirms the perfection of what's there when we cooperate with it. I thought that was such a beautiful response. I walked out of there floating with different respect. Oh, wow. That's that's amazing uh, uh, to have that kind of uh, of understanding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think I think it's so important. Like you know, obviously my field is uh, when I went through my transition, uh, I was uh, suffering from chronic depression, suicidal depression, almost took my life twice. Yeah. And um, I could not mm. shake it. It was just like mm. I felt the world was collapsing in on me constantly. And um, I fortunately had a Native American healer that I met that helped me get to the source of that. And I had a breakthrough that evening that just dramatically changed my life. Wow. But I just lifted all of the suffering and I just saw my connection. I reconnected to myself, my heart the world, everything. Because you world. sure seem like a very joyous person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. And it's like when I tell people about it, they're like, you really? Yeah. Um, but, but that just like shift my world paradigm so much. But I was meditated because I was so floating. I was so full of energy. You know, I was just buzzing. My hands felt like they were plugged into electric sockets. I was seeing aura colors and everything. I mean, just <laughs> my mind was on fire. So I just mm -hmm. stayed up all night because I couldn't sleep, I was so energized. And I stayed up all night meditating on wow. how how can I pay this forward? How can I give this gift forward to others? And in the meditation, my higher voice just said, stop causing suffering to others. And wow, that truth just shot through me. Wow. I quit. I quit doing drugs. I quit drinking. I quit smoking cigarettes, which is really hard to do. And I quit eating all animal products that moment. That is incredible. And that you made that connection. You know, you're going to get a kick out of this, Jeff. When I was, um, when I was about, uh, I guess, 15 or 16, I think I was 16 years old. I can remember going for a walk in the morning and uh, I, I lived near a lake and I got to the lake and I sat on a rock and I started thinking about my life. And I thought to myself, I wonder what my life is really all about. Mm. And I remember saying to myself, I don't know, but what I do know is I want it to be meaningful. Mm. And I thought to myself that, you know, here I was uh, every weekend getting drunk with my friends and, you know, doing these things that, that would interfere with my ability to live a meaningful life. And I vowed to myself on that rock that I would never do anything I could become addicted to from this day forward. And that was it. It was over. And um, and so it it yeah, I've never had a cup of coffee in my life, even, which wow. shocks a lot of people. But uh, I just I thought I want to survive and I want to um, I, I don't I don't want addiction to be part of my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that, you know, that uh, ended up uh, working well for me. <laughs> That's great. And, and I, I, I comment sometimes, I say there are two types of vegans that I know, the, uh, vegans from the inside out, which have a personal experience that causes them to reflect in their actions or outside in, which is they see something outside of themselves that affects them to change something like a film or yeah. a book or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and all of the ways are great and, and important because we need them all to work for everyone. Really. That's right. Uh, but uh, it, it's amazing because when I saw that, I said, okay, as soon as I dropped away everything, well, you know, going from full on drugging and drinking and smoking and eating animal products all the <laughs> time to nothing, 
was just <laughs> wild. I went through a detox <laughs> period for sure. <laughs> and, but I was so just like, I, my mood changed, my health changed, my body weight dropped, my everything, my endurance, my sleep patterns changed, my sexual health changed, everything changed. And I was like, this is incredible. How do I, how do I help with this? So I said, okay, there's two things that most people do pretty much almost every day, which is move and eat, right? <laughs> um, and, and I'm like, okay, let's start there. So I, uh, through my professional life, I said, how can I combine these things? Like my mother was a, a, a therapist, but she was an artist. So she said, okay, I'm working with children who are underprivileged and have a hard time communicating with them because you've got these educated people talking with people with no education at all sometimes. Yeah. And there's a big communication gap. She said, but if you put a piece of clay in front of them, they'll tell you their whole life story. So she developed art <laughs> as a way of getting the wow. kids to express. And I said, okay, well, how can I get, you know, help people in something that they want, physical health, physical, you know, being stronger, being more fit, you know, looking better, feeling better, but do it in a way that incorporates a plant-based diet, influences it so that they can feel and experience some of these changes for the first, for themselves. And that's why I developed, you know, why Form Clean Machine is really to, to really try to reach into um, the sports nutrition category, which was loaded with whey protein, fish oil, mm -hmm. um, horrible stimulants that were actually killing people. And I'm like, okay, this is a section that needs to be improved because yeah. there are nutritional supplements that are important for people that can be very helpful. Ideally, I coach people to get as much as you can from whole food based nutrition. But when there are gaps and deficits, I think it's important to try to do that. Look, like D3, I think it's so important because 90 plus percent of the people tested are too low in D3. And it's because we're indoors. We're not outside. We're not running around naked <laughs> like every other animal on the planet exposed yeah. to sun for the most of our day. We're sitting inside. So we're just not getting the sun. And I'm like, okay, well, if we change our lifestyle, you got to change the nutrition to fit with it, to compensate. That, and absolutely. So <laughs> and if you look up, if you look at the history of nutrition, um, there are so many instances of where we added nutrients uh, to um, animal products because there were deficits. We added iodine to salt. We added vitamin D to milk. We, you know, we've added iron and B vitamins to flour that's refined. We've been doing that for years. So it doesn't, um, you know, if, if we have some additions to a vegan diet, it doesn't mean there's something lacking necessarily uh, um, or that it's inferior somehow, I should say. Um, almost all dietary patterns have some, you know, some need for additional nutrients. Like the, the sailors, they used to call them limeys. Yes. Right? Because they had to bring these small plants of, of lemon and lime trees on their boats so they could get vitamin C. Otherwise, they'd get yeah. scurvy from eating yeah. just nothing exactly. but fish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, amazing. Oh, uh, no, we're coming up on an hour. I feel like I could talk another couple hours. And I feel so <laughs> simpatico with you. I mean, yes. so many different levels. I'd love to have you back. If, if Oh, I would be honored. And thank you so much for inviting me and for all the things that you're doing to make this world a more wonderful, kinder place. Uh, it was really nice to get to know you today. Likewise, the feelings mutual. And thank you for so much amazing work that you're doing. And uh, if, if any way I can ever help in any way, please let me know. I'm here well, you. thank you. I will um, <laughs> just before we go. This is my oh my the new book. book. Yes, yeah, my new Nourish. book. Let me see there. Nourish, yes. and I wrote it with a pediatrician, Reshma Shah, and uh, it is the you know the the comprehensive guidebook for for plant curious, plant predominant, plant exclusive eaters. Uh, if they're raising a, a, a plant-based family. And so we tried to really cover our bases there. And, and I think people will find it quite uh, quite a valuable resource. <laughs> and she's got 12 books. And if you have never heard her speak, she speaks on all kinds of topics. Check out her talk on um, calcium, the latest research on calcium. She goes through line by line debunking that study and showing why you can get calcium from a plant-based diet. So many good videos out there. She's one of the most popular speakers out there. So you can see tons of videos. Tell them where they can follow you on Facebook, social media, YouTube, LinkedIn. 
Yeah, so Facebook is just Brenda Davis. Um, and uh, I have a Brenda Davis RD, I think is my Twitter. I don't even know, Jeff, I'm so bad at this stuff. Um, let's see, I do have Instagram and I just started last week to post a couple little things I'm just learning how to do Instagram. My writing partner, Reshma, is, you know, we do these Instagram lives now, but she does all the work. I just appear. Uh, so I'm learning about that too. And I do have a website, brendadavisrd.com, but I'm I'm not that good at keeping up with that either. I always seem to have so many projects on the go. It's hard to keep up with all the social media, but I'm trying. Before we go real quick, what's next for you? Uh, another book on the way is uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I've got lots of lectures lined up. I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a project with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine for a continuing nice. ed course. I just finished doing one on diabetes. I'm on one of their advisory panels for diabetes reversal kind of a paper. I just finished doing a paper with uh, PCRM on uh, keto diets that'll be published soon. So I've always got lots of things, but the next thing is I'm doing Doing a book on protein with my my uh, writing partner Vasanto. So we're and we've got uh, uh, another partner that's coming in on it as well. So we're excited about that, and we're going to cover a lot of bases and and uh, do a little bit digger deeping in or uh, deep dive into protein. Awesome! I look forward to hearing <laughs> that. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you appreciated and, and enjoyed this, and lots of good takeaways. Again, check out all of Brenda's stuff. You can just Google Brenda and you'll see a whole bunch of links come up. So um, uh, thank you so much. Next week, we'll be having a, a new guest, um, Monk. He is a three-time uh, physique pro, but he's also the author of this new book. And we're going to talk about Love Over Fear. Beautiful book, uh, heart-centered book that I think you'll really enjoy. Thank you, Brenda, so much. Thank for you, Jeff. Up. And thank you so much for having me. And again, thank you for what you're doing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.